Thank you for being here for today's webinar, What's New in Booster Research. And again, as always, today's webinar is brought to you by State Farm and Safe Kids. So first of all, I'd just like to remind everyone that I will be putting the handouts uh, link in the chat box. And also a follow-up email will be coming to you tomorrow afternoon after 2 p.m. And that follow-up email will have your CEU event ID number in it. And it is also going to have the handout link for today's webinar in there as well. Also, as a reminder, if you can please enter your questions into the Q&A box instead of in the chat box so that we don't miss any of your very important questions. And lastly, as a reminder, only the person that's registered for the webinar and is logged in will get credit for watching today's webinar. So if you are watching with friends, that's great. All you need to do is quickly organize an in-person session, just designate a lead, get a sign-in sheet, add that CEU event ID number onto the sign-in sheet, and then the folks will be able to enter that CEU as an in-person session onto their profile page instead of as a webinar. So today's objectives are explaining how boosters work by helping children take advantage of vehicle safety features designed for adults, learning how researchers are studying and improving belt fit for child occupants in boosters, exploring how booster installation methods affect crash outcomes, as an example, installing with versus without latch. So we are very fortunate today to have on the call Julie Mansfield, who is the research assistant professor at the Injury Biomechanics Research Center at The Ohio State University. Julie holds a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in mechanical engineering and a PhD in biomedical engineering. Julie's research focuses on pediatric vehicle safety, especially child restraint system performance and usability. Julie works closely with the industry representatives of the Center for Child Injury Prevention Studies, and she has been a technician since 2014. And we are very fortunate to have you with us today, Julie. And with that, I will hand it over to you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Stephanie. I'm really excited to be here with you today, and I hope that you find this um, talk about booster research to be interesting, and I hope that you find some applicable and useful tips in it um, that will help you do your jobs as CPSTs in the field. Okay, so first of all, um, what is a booster? So traditionally, boosters have looked something like the images that you see on the screen. You can have high-back boosters or backless boosters, and their appearance and function um, was traditionally pretty straightforward. But um, in today's market, we're seeing um, a lot more different variety of boosters. We've got three-in-ones or four-in-ones, um, combination seats. We've got inflatable boosters, travel vests, heightless boosters. And so we've got a lot of different um, variety and some different products to contend with today. So our objectives um, for our talk today have to do with this constantly evolving booster market that we're seeing. And so we're gonna kind of talk through what do we actually define as a booster and what are some basic concepts of a booster and are those concepts changing as these products become more diverse? And then, um, how do researchers or regulators evaluate all of these products? Uh, what types of questions should we be asking to determine the viability of all of these different products? And lastly, importantly, how can CPSTs navigate these products to help caregivers make the best safety decisions for their children? And so this cartoon kind of illustrates how complicated these questions can be. So in the cartoon, the evaluator is judging all of these different animals by their ability to climb a tree, but obviously not every type of animal will succeed at that particular test. So this kind of popped into my head as I was thinking about, you know, is it fair to judge all of these different safety products by the same traditional booster standards? And importantly, is it useful to judge them all by the same tests and by the same questions or are we missing important concepts by only asking the same questions that we've always asked? 
we might need to start kind of thinking critically and exploring some other questions that we've never really had to ask before. So let's go back to the basics um, to kick things off here, kind of good refresher for everybody. At their most basic, boosters work by adjusting the position of the child and or the position of the seat belt to provide optimal protection. Specifically, um, a booster should ensure that the shoulder belt is centered over the shoulder so that the belt is not too close to the neck and it's not too close to the edge of the shoulder or it's going to slip off entirely. Boosters also help to adjust the position of the lap belt so that it sits low on the hips or at the tops of the thighs, which ensures that the lap belt is not too high over the child's stomach and soft tissue in the abdomen. Boosters can help prevent slouching. Um, they make sure that the child can sit upright with their backs against the back surface of the vehicle seat or against the back surface of the booster if it's a high back. And traditionally, um, they do this by shortening the length of the seating surface so that the child um, can sit comfortably with their knees bent over the edge of the booster seat. And then lastly, um, a good booster should ensure that the child can maintain this optimal posture and good belt position for the entire ride. We know that children have quite a bit of freedom of movement in a booster, more than they have in a five-point harness. And so it's extra important that a booster can provide a comfortable seating environment so that the child will be more likely to stay in that good position for extended periods of time. So one way um, to succinctly summarize the role of what we have traditionally thought of a booster is that they boost the child up so that their seated height is more similar to an adult's. And this helps the child to take advantage of all of the different safety features in the vehicle that were designed for adult occupants. Um, the first we already talked about, and that's the seat belt. So boosters improve the general fit of the seat belt across the shoulder and across the hips. Seat belts um, also sometimes have additional, additional technology built into them, such as pretensioners, which help remove the slack from the seat belt in the instant before the crash happens. And some seat belts also have load limiters, which are exactly what they sound like. They prevent the seat belt from exerting too much force against the body during the actual crash event. Most rear seats also have side airbags, and this can include several different types. Uh, the most common and most familiar type is the curtain airbag, and its main purpose is to protect the head and prevent the head from striking against the window or the door frame. And then there are also different side airbags that might protect the torso or the pelvis in some rear seats. Rear seats also have strategically placed padding on the door uh, to help protect different body parts from the door frame. And then of course there are head restraints, um, which we're all familiar with, which support the head in rear impact kind of whiplash scenarios. Now, spoiler alert, uh, despite the fact that children are frequent occupants of the rear row, all of these rear row safety features are designed mostly to benefit adults, not children. And I do wanna note that the current versions of these safety features in the rear seat do not appear to be dangerous to children. Um, you know, we all sadly are familiar with, you know, the big frontal airbags in the front row of seats um, that can cause um, injuries to children, especially in the older generation frontal airbags that came out in the 90s. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. So ve vehicle manufacturers have learned from that lesson and all of the vehicle safety features um, in the rear seat are more thoroughly vetted now to make sure that they don't cause harm to children. So. If you've heard my other presentations, I like to harp on this fact a lot that children are not small adults. Um, so it's really important that manufacturers do their due diligence to ensure that the safety features designed for adults are at the very least not harmful to kids. Um, in fact, though, we found that all of the things on this list on the slide can actually be beneficial for children if the child is positioned properly. Um, so one way to do this is using a booster to kind of boost the child up more close to the height of an adult so that they can be in the optimal position to take advantage of all of these vehicle safety features that were designed for adult size occupants. And I just wanted to quickly note here that these concepts are a little bit different than what we talk about for a rear facing or forward facing CRS with a five point harness. Those harnessed CRSs um, rely less on the vehicle safety features 
because of that internal five point harness. So the harness is doing most of the work of restraining the child um, and it's all kind of a little bit more self-contained. So the occupant interacts less with the vehicle environment. There's certainly still some interaction, um, especially sometimes with side airbags and things like that, but they're re less reliant on those things and you know, less reliant on you know, the seatbelt because the seatbelt is just holding in the um, child restraint. So it's still doing an important job, but we're not looking at things like seatbelt fit over the child themselves. Um, so it's really the boosters that rely more on the vehicle environment um, like I said, most obviously the seatbelt, because that's actually restraining the child. And we're going to kind of talk through that and see how some of the other factors come into play for boosters as well. So I want to take some time and kind of step through each of these different features in the vehicle that affect boosters and how we're learning more about each one as research and technology progresses. So let's start with how researchers are looking into the fit of the seatbelt specifically. So I wanted to talk briefly about IIHS or the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. Um, this is a great organization who has done a lot of work looking at seatbelt fit and boosters. You might already be familiar with their booster ratings. Um, if you haven't checked this out yet, please do. It's been around for several years now, um, but it's a really great and publicly accessible rating system that contains data on a huge amount of boosters on the current U.S. market. So IIHS rates each booster into one of four categories. The highest rating is best bet, followed by good bet, then check fit, and the lowest category is not recommended. And good news, um, there are currently no boosters on the market with this lowest rating. To evaluate each booster, IIHS places it on a simplified vehicle seat bench. The seatbelt hardware on this bench is adjustable, so they move the seatbelt anchor points around to different positions to see how each booster can accommodate the range of seatbelt geometries available in cars today. For their occupant, IIHS uses a dummy they call JASPER, which stands for Juvenile Anthropomorphic Seatbelt Position Evaluation Rig. Uh, you'll notice that JASPER is a pretty simplified version of a real child. He's got no arms or legs, uh, he's kind of stiff, so he doesn't wiggle around too much like a real child but he's got a couple of really good advantages. Uh, the first being that he's 3D printed. And this is a huge cost saving strategy because traditional crash test dummies are very, very expensive. So 3D printing a simplified shape form uh, like Jasper saves tens of thousands of dollars for researchers who really just need the shape of the dummy and not all of the internal workings and sensors that you need for a full scale crash test dummy. Jasper also has um, handy ways to measure how the seatbelt fits in each booster that he sits in. So he's got these measuring guides um, printed directly onto him. So this makes data collection pretty easy. They can just look at where the seatbelt hits and read off the number. So using these tools, IHS collects a few main metrics from each booster. They look at the shoulder belt score or SBS, which shows where the shoulder belt crosses over the shoulder area of Jasper. Ratings in the green area are good. Yellow is marginal, and then red shows areas where the belt is either too far out on the shoulder or too close to the neck. A similar scale is used for lap belt score or LBS. Um, so we're looking at a side view of the hips here. And you can see, again, the ideal region for the belt is marked in green, and then the yellow and red show belt fits that are either too high on the abdomen or too far forward on the thighs. They also look um, from the side view at the fore aft distance at a reference point on the upper chest uh, to see if the belt fits snugly on the chest or if it's kind of floating out in front of the chest with a gap uh, between the belt and the upper torso. So these items combined allow IHS to come up with their rating categories for each booster and their search system is very, very easy. Um, you can see you can just type in the name of any booster and the results populate. So here I just typed in Graco and you can see um, that it pulled up the forever first, a couple different versions of the forever, and it's got um, their best bet ratings up for both of those versions. IIHS is just one example of a company and researchers doing some of the groundwork of evaluating boosters and finding areas that might need improvement. Um, so Consumer Reports is another fantastic resource for CRS and booster evaluations. Their protocol is a little bit more extensive. Um, they install each booster into five different vehicles. Um, so they are using actual vehicles instead of the simplified test bench, and that's how they get their variety of different seat types and belt geometries to test. 
Uh, Consumer Reports also does what they call a movement test. So they put the dummy in and kind of wiggle it around in the booster to see if the um, belt stays in its proper position during uh, normal movement of a child occupant. Consumer Reports also um, factors in some of the ease of use evaluations. So how easy the booster is to use and buckle and they look at uh, the booster's labeling and instructions to see how straightforward or confusing those might be. And then lastly, importantly, um, they do a dynamic safety component in their evaluation, so their own crash testing that they're conducting. So this is a really um, nice, well-rounded evaluation protocol that contains several different aspects of booster usability and performance. So those are some great resources um, that you can access for consumer-focused recommendations of different booster models. But I want to talk a little bit more about how you can effectively use these resources during interactions with caregivers. So I think we've all had caregivers at C-Checks or even friends and family ask us, which booster should I buy? Which is the best one? And as technicians, we know that the only correct answer to that question is that the best booster is the one that fits the vehicle, fits the child, and will be used correctly for every single trip. And this really is true. This is the best overall advice that we can give caregivers. Now, that being said, I think we can all agree that, you know, spouting off this canned response is not particularly helpful on its own. So we as educators need to follow up and provide some more specific advice and um, help guide caregivers to a booster that works for them. So I like to start by teaching caregivers um, kind of three main checkpoints to help them recognize a good fitting booster. The first, um, ensure the seat belt crosses over the center of the shoulder. Two, ensure the lap belt sits low on the hips. And three, um, ensure that the child can stay properly positioned for the entire ride, meaning that they are comfortable enough in their seated position to stay put for a while. So three easy things, shoulder, hips, entire ride easy list that caregivers um, can remember and can just kind of do by looking at their own child. Um, in an ideal world though, we can extend the education even beyond just these three points. So um, if you're at a seat check or talking with a friend, you can really take some time um, to ask some questions to see exactly what the family situation is and what their needs are for a booster seat. So here are some examples of things that you might ask a caregiver to better understand their situation and be more effective at guiding them um, to a booster product that will work best for them. And these are just some examples. I'm sure you all have lots of other great questions in your toolkits um, to help you guide these conversations. Um, you can even put some in the chat if you've got some questions that you love to ask um, caregivers about boosters. I'm sure we can all learn a lot from each other on this one. But I like to always ask, you know, is the child a new or experienced booster rider? And keeping in mind that a high back booster um, can sometimes be better for a first time booster rider because they can help keep um, the shoulder belt better aligned. And they also help the child to stay sitting up straight. You know, even if they fall asleep, they can lean against the side wings um, and stay in that optimal position a little bit easier compared to a backless booster. You might ask, are there typically other passengers next to the child? Um, this might affect how wide or how bulky the booster can be that they want to buy. Will the booster stay in one vehicle or be moved around often? You know, maybe if it's going to stay put, maybe they can get a bigger, heavier booster, or maybe they want kind of a lighter, more portable booster if they're going to move it around a lot. Are you buying just one or are you buying multiple versions of this booster for multiple different vehicles? This might affect the price point that they're willing to pay. Will the booster be handed down to a younger sibling? Um, this might also affect price point if they can get extra use out of it before it expires. Um, or maybe um, if it's a very younger sibling, they might want to consider a combination seat so that it can also be used as a forward facing harness um, for a, a younger sibling. So once you talk through um, this information, you might be better equipped to suggest a certain type of booster or at least you know, which features to prioritize. The, size, different modes available, price point, etc. And then um, at that point, if a caregiver wants advice on specific brands or specific models, at this point, it might be helpful to refer them to reliable rating resources such as IAHS or Consumer Reports, where they can kind of browse through some targeted types of products um, and pick one that works for them. So hopefully um, now you can see you understand a little bit more about how these evaluation and rating programs work, and then you can use them effectively to supplement your own tailored guidance as a CPST. 
So let's move on now um, and talk about some brand new research um, that is happening and some of it is still currently happening and talk about how this work is really continuing to push the envelope on our scientific knowledge of boosters. So first off, I wanna introduce another um, measurement for belt fit evaluations that is currently being explored. Um, this work is being done by a graduate student in our lab, Gretchen Baker. Uh, Gretchen is about to earn her PhD in biomedical engineering, and she has spent the last several years looking at belt fit in boosters, and specifically the spot on the lower torso that you see circled. So um, if you look at the picture, you can see how the belt is routing um, around the armrest of the booster and creating a small gap um, between the belt and the child's body. Uh, she noticed this gap while looking at video footage of children in actual vehicles as they were being driven around a test track um, for a different study. And she began to wonder whether the presence or size of this gap might affect how well the seat belt could stay in place, um, both before a crash and during a crash. So um, Gretchen, along with our team at OSU, recruited 50 kids ages 4 to 14 to come sit on 10 different boosters in our lab. Um, she measured hundreds of different data points for each child on each booster. She looked at how well the seat belt fit each child. Um, she measured the length and size of any gap um, between the belt and the torso. She looked at where different anatomic landmarks were located in 3D space. Um, she had this really cool um, 3D system to record each child's posture as they sat in the seat. It's called Xsense. Uh, it creates this really cool little robot avatar on the computer screen, and the kids can make it move around or dance or wave. So they had a lot of fun with that. And once we had all the child data, um, she also repeated the same measurement measurements on um, several different pediatric crash test dummies so that we could compare how the seat belt fits each dummy compared to the real children. Here are some photos um, of the real children. So the picture on the left shows, you can see the booster is kind of pulling the seat belt a little further forward as it routes um, through the proper uh, belt path. And it creates a bit of a gap near the torso. And then the photo on the right is kind of a unique booster that actually doesn't have an armrest. And this different design allows the belt to route directly against the torso all the way around. So this work is still underway, but some preliminary conclusions that I can share with you today are, um, you know, as we saw, the belt gap varies based on different features on different boosters. And this may seem a little obvious, but now we have some exact measurements and exact data to tell us exactly how much gap is created by different types of booster features and how that gap changes for adult or for um, children of different sizes and different ages. And so we can use that data um, for future testing, um, such as crash testing and things like that. She also found uh, that pediatric crash test dummies on average tended to have larger belt gaps than real children. So the dummies overestimated this gap. And this is important because we already know that crash test dummies are not perfect representations of children, but now we have very specific data about how this one additional way um, that they seem to differ. So two publications containing this work are coming out this fall, um, and I'm happy uh, to put you in touch with Gretchen and we can share some of these resources if you're interested in more details. Uh, one very important question on this topic of belt gap is, does this belt gap affect crash safety or booster performance? And the answer is we don't know yet. Um, and I really wanna emphasize this because we don't fully understand how this gap affects actual children and how or if it should be prioritized as something to check for. So it's something we're currently crash testing and learning more about. Um, but for the time being, you know, if you notice a booster with this type of belt gap out in the field, I don't want anybody to panic, nobody panic. Um, as long as the belt is crossing over the hips and the shoulders in the correct places, um, then we can be confident that that booster will work as intended to protect the child in it. Um, the hips and shoulders are the best proven factors to examine when you're checking belt fit on a booster. And I just wanted to kind of introduce this study as an example of how scientists are currently exploring to see whether there might be some different ways to improve in the future. Um, next, the next new study I want to talk about is this one by Dr. Monica Jones um, up at um, the University of Michigan and the rest of her team. So we're rivals with Michigan on the football field, but I have to admit that they do a lot of really nice child safety research. Um, so in this study, they looked at seatbelt fit and posture in some slightly different ways. And full disclosure, um, I was not involved in this work. So today I am just giving a brief overview of what can be found um, in the publication that you see cited here. 
Um, so Dr. Jones et al. measured posture and belt fit for 25 children, ages 4 to 12 years, in a variety of boosters, vehicle seat cushion lengths, and belt geometries. Uh, the photo is an example um, of a child in one of their test setups, and you can see that this is one of their examples of poor fit and poor posture. The lap belt looks like it's crossing too high on the stomach. Um, it's not really anchored on the strong points of the pelvis. Uh, the shoulder belt looks like it might be hitting her neck, um, although it's kind of hard to tell at this angle. Overall, she looks a little slouched, like maybe the seat cushion is too long for her knees to comfortably um, bend over the edge of the seat while sitting up straight. So they looked at all different conditions like these. They recorded all of the different postures and outcomes on a variety of different seats and boosters. And in this paper, um, they discuss how traditional boosters raise the head height of the child closer to that of an average adult. So in these quick little drawings that I put together here, you know, we see that a child sitting in a vehicle seat without a booster, um, the head is maybe at this height. If we put that same little child sketch in a booster, the head is raised up, um, essentially the height of whatever the booster is. And then that might be about the same level as an adult sitting in that same seat. And something uh, that the researchers looked at in the Jones et al. paper is that not all boosts are created equal. That is, some boosters raise children's seated height higher than others because some boosters are just higher, right? Like the part that the child sits on is thicker than others. The boosters in the Jones study had boost heights of 45 to 177 millimeters or about 1.8 to 7 inches. However, some boosters on the market are even thinner than that, um, potentially less than 10 millimeters thick or less than half an inch. Um, and so as you might expect, uh, the thinner boosters were not able to boost the child children up uh, to the typical adult height range. Um, and you can see, oh, I took that slide out, but um, basically the thinner boosters don't um, boost the children up as high. And here are some examples of why this might be important. So, this is one design of a side airbag in a vehicle. So they've got an adult size crash dummy in the rear seat for reference. Um, and you can see um, that the design of this airbag, the soft cushy parts of the airbag are kind of um, right next to the, the adult's head. And if we click through, um, side airbags are, are different for every make and model of different vehicles. Each manufacturer kind of designs and tests their own airbag. Um, so this one, you can see that the pillowy part of the airbag near the head is even a little bit smaller, um, and this part of the airbag doesn't really seem to inflate down here. So you can envision if a short child is sitting in the seat and the child's head is only, you know, maybe at this height, they're not going to be able to get the full benefit of that airbag because it was designed for an occupant of an adult's height. And here's a few more examples. So again, this airbag, you see it's nice soft cushy where the head of the adult is. This one is nice, it kind of extends um, along the, the base of the window all the way forward. Um, but again, not a whole lot going on down here um, where a shorter child's head might be. Um, and here's some different examples. So these are kind of torso and hip airbags. So this type of airbag, you know, it, it might benefit um, children who are a little bit shorter, but again, it's designed to interact with the adult um, torso and the adult hips. And so if a shorter child, you know, if the child's head is interacting with the torso area of the airbag, um, again, that's not really what it was meant for. And so we don't really know if that child would benefit fully from uh, this particular safety feature. Like I mentioned before, um, these types of side curtain airbags in the rear row do not seem to threaten children at all. And in fact, like I said, we've got evidence that they can be beneficial for children who are properly restrained in side impacts. Um, at this point, maybe you're wondering, you know, what about high back CRSs that have large side wings? Do those side wings serve the same purpose as a side curtain airbag? Um, in theory, yes, those side wings on boosters can provide some protection in side impacts. However, they work best um, when the crash happens at a very pure side impact. So, for example, if your car was literally sitting still and you just got completely T-boned from the side, um, then it would work kind of at its best. But that's not really how most crashes happen. Uh, most crashes that we categorize as side impact crashes have a little bit of frontal component to them, meaning that the car that is being struck on the side is also usually traveling forward at the time of impact. And this forward movement of the struck vehicle um, causes the head to kind of move forward during a crash. It doesn't move straight to the side. And so when that happens, the head can kind of swing out and around 
the side wings on a booster or a CRS. And you can see that happening in the photo here. So the side wings can certainly help, um, but they aren't perfect on their own. And of course, um, backless boosters don't have side wings at all. So in that case, the child occupant is even more reliant on the safety features in the vehicle, uh, similar to how an adult seatbelt would be. Um, so hopefully you understand now a little bit more about how boosters work, um, not only to position the adult seatbelt properly over the skeleton, but also um, to help the child benefit more from the safety features such as side airbags in the way that a taller adult would. However, um, before you go out and you know, recommend that the caregiver should buy you know, the highest, tallest booster possible, there's a few other things to consider. So side curtain airbags only help in near side impacts. So when the child is seated right next to the side that's um, the side of the vehicle that's being impacted. So side curtain airbags um, don't really apply to children who are seated on the far side of the vehicle during the crash, or you know, maybe even children seated in the center position. And so the height of the child and the height of the booster might have different effects or might have no effect at all in these different crash types. So there's a lot of other factors to consider. Um, what I'm trying to say here is that a super tall booster, you know, might not be necessary or helpful in every type of crash scenario, depending on the child's starting height, you know, they might not need a huge boost. So traditionally, this is kind of what boosters have done, but I just wanted to clarify that point um, before we move on, that this is kind of one specific crash scenario that we're looking at. In addition to head height, um, the Jones et al. study looked at how boosters help children fit better lengthwise on the vehicle seat. So they found um, that low height boosters produced postures that were more slouched with the hips further forward um, than other more traditional boosters. And as you can see, again, in my little drawing of what's happening here, when the thigh of the child is too short for their knees to bend over the edge of the seat um, comfortably, then the child tends to scoop forward um, on the seat and kind of slouch back into a more comfortable position. So sitting in a raised booster um, shortens the effective length of the seating surface and allows them to um, comfortably bend their knees over the edge of the booster in a way that doesn't require them to slouch forward. If we add the seatbelt into our drawings, um, you can see that the slouch position changes the angle of the seatbelt. The slouch causes the belt to route more horizontally, um, which um, increases the chances of submarining. And so, um, they can just kind of slide right under the lap belt in that scenario. Um, boosting the child up routes the lap belt more vertically, which helps keep it low on the hips and the upper thighs, even when the child is propelled forward during a crash. So this more vertical um, belt route um, really kind of helps pull the belt down, um, and, sorry, keep the belt low, um, and, and it can kind of um, interact with the hips in a, in a better way during a crash. So what can you as technicians do with this information? Um, we already discussed that improving belt fit is the most obvious and most critical role of a booster. Uh, remember those checkpoints at the shoulder and the hips. But going a step further, um, the child's posture in the booster is also important from a crash protection standpoint. Uh, the height of the child's head along with their leg length and slouch are all important um, factors to look at to help a child achieve an optimal position with respect to the seat belt and airbags during a crash. Um, there are also some practical considerations here, namely the comfort of the child. So a child in a vehicle seat or booster that doesn't fit them right will not be comfortable and they will not stay in that ideal position for very long. So at this point, maybe you're asking yourself, um, what about the low height or heightless boosters that we're seeing on the market? Um, inherently, by their design, um, they do not um, boost the child up to fit into the seatbelt. Um, rather, they pull the seatbelt down to position it over the child. And since there is no boost, um, they do not raise the height of the child's head. So we might be missing out on some of the protection of um, certain side airbag designs. Um, heightless boosters also um, do not shorten the length of the seatbelt. So um, some kids are more tempted to slouch in them unless they can find another comfortable alternative, like maybe crossing their legs in front of them. So these are conclusions we can make just by looking at the basic design of these boosters. Um, that being said, there might be scenarios where a low height booster might be the best option or the only practical option. Like if a family is traveling by plane and needs a really compact or portable booster at their destination, or maybe in a carpool where you need to fit three children across in a, a small rear row. So these situations do exist, and on this topic, I encourage you 
as CPSTs to exercise your good, better, best mindset. Um, recognizing that, you know, a heightless booster may not be the very best option for normal everyday travel because of some of the limitations that we've talked about. But there might be some situations where this is still a good option, especially if the alternative option is no booster at all. So remember to, you know, ask some questions to the caregivers that you're working with, figure out what scenario they're in, figure out what their situation is, and then implement your good, better, best mindset um, to help them find a good solution for their children. One more point as we wrap up this section is to reiterate clearly that um, boosters and all CRS really work in harmony with the vehicle and with the child occupant. Safety, safety products do not exist in a vacuum. So it's really important that manufacturers, researchers, CPSTs, caregivers all come together with the information that they have. And each of the people on this list are kind of experts in different areas, right? CRS manufacturers know their products inside and out and vehicle manufacturers know their products inside and out. Um, but it's really important that those two different groups communicate with each other and ensure that the whole system is working together. Um, caregivers are obviously experts on their own children, um, but they might not have the technical knowledge to navigate some of these topics. And so um, I really think that CPSTs are in a really important position here because you guys work directly in the crossroads of all of these different pieces coming together. You're curbside with caregivers trying to you know, fit together their CRS into their vehicle with their child. And so I really applaud you um, in the challenging job that you do in fitting all these pieces together. So bravo. Um, and on that note, um, some, some tips here are to seek help when you need it. Um, you, you're not expected as a CPST to know everything about every product right off the top of your head, but you should know where to find it. Um, pertinent information about those products. So keep your instruction manuals handy. Get familiar with manufacturers' websites. Don't be afraid to call manufacturers' helplines. Use your latch manual, etc. cetera. Um, use all these tools to your advantage. Um, and also speak up about problems that you see. Um, you know, if you're trying to fit something together in a vehicle and it's just not working out, um, you know, let the manufacturer know. You know, call the manufacturer. What do I do in this situation? Um, you know, the manufacturers and researchers can't fix a problem that they don't know exists. And so you guys can really be the eyes and ears um, out there on the field to um, help make these products better in the long run. So last topic today, um, I wanted to um, kind of look at what happens um, for some crash testing and how boosters are being crash tested and what work is being done there. So the first study I will talk through is another one out of the University of Michigan. This one was led by Dr. Kathy Klinich. Um, they looked at a few new metrics, so new measurements that engineers could look at during crash testing to differentiate good booster performance from poor booster performance. Um, and another disclosure, I was not involved in this work, so I'm just preventing, presenting a brief summary of what their publication says. Um, traditionally, booster manufacturers are required to meet um, four um, criteria on a um, vehicle test bench, which looks like this. So they use this test bench in place of an actual vehicle seat. Um, it's kind of a standardized representative form. And currently they must meet the following four criteria to pass the test. The head excursion of the dummy and knee excursion of the dummy or you know, the forward movement of the head and the knees have to fall below a certain amount to help reduce the risk of the head or knees um, striking uh, the seat back in front of them. Um, the head injury criterion or HIC um, is a calculation of head acceleration. So that needs to be below a certain level and the chest acceleration also must be below a certain level. The new work um, by Klinich et al. suggests that looking at some new criteria might also be helpful. And um, they specifically point out that it could be useful to look at the difference between head and knee excursion and also um, the maximum torso angle or kind of how much the torso leans forward during the crash test. And these two measurements combined um, tell engineers whether the dummy is leaning forward into the seat belt at the proper angle. Um, you actually want the shoulders to lean forward a certain amount into the belt as the shoulder engages with the seat belt. Alternatively, if the dummy stays leaning back too far during a test, this suggests that the dummy might submarine or might slide under the lap belt. So looking at the torso angle can tell us this and can tell us how well um, the dummy is engaging with the seat belt. Also, um, there are some values from the lumbar spine um, or the lower spine region that appear to be helpful. 
uh, the force in the spine in the sideways direction, and also the torsion or twist on the spine. And these researchers noticed that boosters that provide uh, the best restraint have certain patterns in these measurements that are different from boosters that do not provide good restraint. So these are some areas um, that researchers are taking a closer look at, and they might be able to tell us a more detailed analysis of how each modern booster performs beyond the original four measurements um, that we've been looking at for decades, essentially. Lastly, um, I'll mention a study that uh, we recently published looking at the two different ways to install boosters, um, with latch or without latch. And in this case, I was the lead researcher on the study, um, so I'm happy to talk about it in more depth if you have any questions about this one. Um, we as technicians know that many boosters have lower anchors and top tether hardware, but the use of the latch system is sometimes optional um, during use in booster mode, according to the manufacturer's instructions. And caregivers um, sometimes have questions about which method is better. Um, we know that um, installing a booster with latch will uh, stabilize the booster during entry and exit of the seat, and that using latch can also prevent an unoccupied booster from becoming a projectile in a crash. Um, the latch might also help control the mass of the booster or the weight of the booster during a crash. So, you know, it just kind of keeps it in place um, even better even when it is occupied and kind of um, prevent that booster from sliding around or, or pressing against the child in the seat belt. However, um, we were able to find one potential disadvantage of using latch where the occupant could uh, decouple from the booster, meaning that the booster stays latched in place, but the dummy continues to move forward um, until it fully engages with the seat belt. And in that scenario, the seat belt might have a harder time staying properly positioned because the occupant is kind of moving independently of the booster itself. And so we wanted to run some additional uh, crash tests to see what's going on here and to collect some more data. So we ran a total of 16 crash tests um, in the frontal crash direction. We looked at four different high back boosters and two backless boosters from a variety of manufacturers. And we tested each one um, installed with the latch and then a separate trial not installed with latch with just the seat belt um, over top of the occupant. We ran our tests on a modern sedan seat and we replaced the seat cushion, the booster and the seat belt after every test. So everything was all fresh and new for each crash. We used the hybrid three six-year-old dummy as our occupant for all of the boosters. And we tested using um, roughly the federal regulatory um, frontal impact pulse, although we were a little bit above it at um, 50 kilometers per hour the test is supposed to have a maximum of 48 kilometers per hour. So we came in a little bit hot um, compared to the federal regulatory test, but still within um, you know, what we would see in, in a um, moderate to high severity test. So here are a couple of videos from the test. Um, the video on top is um, the booster um, not installed with the latch. So just the seat belt um, routed over top of the booster and the occupant and the booster on the bottom uh, that booster is installed with lower anchors and top tether, and then of course the seat belt over the dummy occupant. And just looking at these videos, um, they look pretty similar. You can see um, the non-latch booster on top, maybe the top of the booster leans forward a little bit more, um, but in terms of what the dummy is doing, they look really similar. Oops, too far. And here's some freeze frames um, from that test. So on the left are kind of the starting position of each test. And then on the right, we took a still frame at the point of maximum excursion. Um, and if you kind of look at those red lines as a guide, um, at this first red line, you can see, yeah, okay, the, the booster that's not installed with um, the lower anchors or top tether, um, we see these camera targets are a little bit further forward of this reference line. But if we look at the dummy itself, um, this red line comes through pretty much the same place on the dummy's head. Um, and so the dummy itself isn't really moving any um, more or less um, between these two tests. So latching the booster in place um, doesn't seem to affect the movement of the occupant very much. And if you think about it, um, this makes sense because it's the seatbelt itself that's actually stopping the movement of the dummy. And the seatbelt is not really attached to the booster. It just kind of runs through the belt guides. So from that perspective, um, we thought it made sense that the dummy occupant um, can kind of move independently of the booster itself. Um, that's quite different from, say, a forward-facing CRS with a harness, because in that case, um, the harness that restrains the occupant is directly attached to the CRS shell. So if the CRS moves forward, it's taking the occupant with it. 
So that's why it's really important that the harnessed um, forward facing CRS is tightly installed and that we're using the top tether and everything because, you know, that the child really is at the mercy of how much that booster moves or how much that CRS moves. Um, but with the booster, um, the booster's main job is just to lift the child up so that the seatbelt can do its job. And so that's what we're seeing here. The booster is, you know, allowing the child to interact effectively with the seatbelt. And whether the booster is latched or non-latched, um, it appears to have only minimal impact on the forward excursion of the occupant in these particular cases. So we made lots of graphs um, and charts to show this concept. Um, here we're looking at how much the booster moved for each test. So the longer blue bars um, show that the non-latched boosters moved farther forward than the latched boosters, which are shown in orange. Um, however, if we look at the head movement specifically, um, the head movement was very similar, regardless of whether the booster was latched or not. So each of these pairs of bars um, showing these corresponding conditions are pretty similar on average. And we see slightly different patterns depending on um, the, the specific model um, of the booster. Let me skip that one. Um, we did find something kind of interesting looking at seatbelt loads. So we measured how much force or how much tension is being exerted on the seatbelt itself during the test. And the two boosters um, whose latch system included a top tether are circled here in orange. And we can see that maybe using that top tether reduced the shoulder belt load um, in orange compared to the test without the latch system in blue. Um, interestingly, um, combination seat C, so this um, particular booster model was the heaviest booster in the group. This booster weighed 25 pounds just by itself. And so it appears that um, restraining some of that booster's weight with the latch system and specifically with the top tether helped to reduce the amount of force in the seat belt, um, which of course um, could potentially press against the child's body. So that was one interesting thing we found. Um, that's just for the shoulder belt though. If we look at, um, this is, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had the lap belt on here. If we look at the lap belt um, portion, we don't really see that same pattern. So again, no big consistent differences here um, comparing latch to non-latch installations. Um, so to summarize this study, um, the latch reduced the movement of the booster, but it did not really affect head movement. So this implies um, that there could be some relative movement between the booster and the occupant for non-latch tests, but um, the consequences of this appear to be minimal. Um, there was no evidence of the occupant submarining under the seat belt in any of our tests. Um, they never submarined under the belt. They never slipped off the front edge of the booster. We didn't see any major red flags in that. And we also checked all of our data using the new booster metrics proposed by Clinic et al. in that study that I just talked through. Um, we didn't see any major red flags um, for our tests using those new metrics either. Um, we did notice that using the top tether appeared to uh, maybe reduce shoulder belt load. Um, and this might be especially useful um, for heavier combination seat boosters. So again, um, overall, the results of the study um, support current recommendations um, in that optional latch usage um, is, that seems to be appropriate when the manufacturers allow that. Um, so if the latch is present and the manufacturer allows its use in booster mode and the caregiver wants to use it, sure, go ahead, like I mentioned it, keeps the booster in place while the child climbs in and prevents an unoccupied booster from becoming a projectile. On the other hand, um, if the latch isn't feasible to use or the caregiver prefers not to, then it's probably fine to use the booster without it as long as it's allowed by the manufacturer. Um, again, always consult those instruction manuals and follow the manufacturer's recommended guidelines. Sometimes the manufacturer says, you know, yeah, technically each is allowed, but we prefer that you use a latch installation in booster mode. Um, and again, um, do your best to follow those guidelines. The manufacturers have obviously, you know, crash tested each of their products way, way more than I have. This was just kind of a generic study looking at a small sample of boosters. So obviously always listen to the manufacturer, but hopefully this study um, kind of gives you an idea um, of how a booster can work in either installation mode using latch or non-latch. Um, and like I said, um, our, our results um, support that either one of those modes um, seems to be fine in the, the boosters that we studied in this um, test. Of course, there are some limitations, um, as I was kind of alluding to. We only looked at six booster models and one vehicle seat model. Um, we had a limited number of repeated tests. And so 
and you know we know that there's limitations in the dummy and we also only looked at these boosters in frontal impacts so you know looking at something like a side impact might be different so there are of course always limitations but um, the, of the data that we found um, hopefully this helps clarify um, kind of to you how boosters can work in these different scenarios so um, some final conclusions we're just about at time here so just to recap um, everything that we've talked about today Boosters um, should provide good belt fit in the lap and shoulder areas. Um, they can boost a child up to help them achieve good posture and good positioning in order to get the full benefit from adult safety features in the vehicle. To do this, um, boosters should also provide a comfortable seating environment so that the child can willingly stay in that proper position for the entire ride. Hopefully this um, gave you some interesting insight as to how researchers and manufacturers are always searching for ways to improve the current state of the art. Um, always remember to apply your concepts of good, better, best to help find acceptable solutions that work for each family's needs as you're out there curbside. And of course, always, always, always um, follow manufacturers instructions. Those manufacturers are fantastic resources of information. Um, obviously they know their products inside and out. So if you ever have a question about a specific booster, get in contact with those folks um, and they can share a wealth of information with you. Um, here are some of my main references that I talked through um, today. If you're interested in any of the papers or um, resources that I talked about, just shoot me an email, let me know. Um, I'm happy to, to share those resources with you. So thank you. And um, now I think we can switch to some questions and answers. You bet. Thank you, Julie. Um, as you can see, if you go to your chat box, you will see that a lot of folks have really enjoyed your presentation today as well as I did. And the research is just amazing. And thank you so much for sharing that with us. And we do have time for some of the questions. If we don't get to all of your questions. Um, Julie, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave the slide up there and, and you can go ahead and reach out to Julie with any of your questions that you would have that are not answered. So one of a uh, question that came up a few times, Julie, was what age does Jasper represent? Oh, that is a good question. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I imagine it's somewhere between six and 10 years old, um, but that's a great question. I think the six-year-old has kind of been traditionally used um, for most booster fit metrics. Um, so if I had to guess, I'd say six to eight, but I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head, sorry. Um, but I will say that IAHS um, does a really great job of documenting um, all of their studies and protocols. So you might be able to find that information um, just as easy as I can with a quick Google search because it is all very public. They do a great job with that. Great. Naomi asked, what are the injury rates of boosters that are unsecured without a child sitting in it? Does the weight of the booster cause injury in a crash? Um, I'm not sure if we have data specifically on that. I think that's kind of more of a, I don't want to say common sense because it's not something you might immediately think of, but there are certainly documented cases of children being injured by cargo in vehicles, by unsecured cargo. Um, in vehicles and, you know, whether that cargo is a booster seat or a suitcase or a duffel bag or whatever, it's, it's not always specified, but um, we do have case studies of, you know, children being hurt by things flying around the vehicle that aren't secured. So, um, you know, just the fact that a booster seat could also, um, you know, an unsecured booster could fly around the vehicle and become a projectile and hurt a child. Um, I don't have specific data to share with you from that, but it, I think it kind of follows reason um, that it's it's better off to have those boosters secured down um, to protect everybody in the cabin. Great. And then Justin is asking, are car manufacturers aware that the side airbags don't go further down to help protect children or smaller adults who usually sit in the back seat? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so some vehicle manufacturers do have those airbags down a little bit lower um, near the torso or hip area of adults. Um, I suspect it might have something to do with the out of position testing that most vehicle manufacturers do. So vehicle manufacturers um, go above and beyond in terms of their airbag testing because they will do tests where they'll take like a six-year-old crash test dummy and 
lean that dummy up against the door of the vehicle. So maybe the child is like turned sideways, kind of laying across the vehicle seat with their back leaned against the door. So very, very out of position and hopefully a position that, you know, we don't ever see, but of course, you know, there's, there's people out there who will let their children sit like that. And so they might design those airbags um, with those extreme cases in mind. Um, and so again, you know, vehicle manufacturers, there's a large range of occupants in that rear row. And so if they design towards the properly positioned children and the properly positioned adults, then that upper airbag um, range near the adult head should provide, um, you know, good protection for all of those properly positioned occupants. But again, it, it might be something where they're looking at kids who are very far out of position and they maybe don't want that airbag in certain areas because it could cause um, more harm than good in those scenarios. Um, again, I'm, I'm not a vehicle manufacturer. This is just kind of my hypothesis, maybe one reason why um, there might be, I'm sure there's other reasons why out there, um, but that's just something that comes to mind. Sure, that's great. A couple of times this question came up, when using a heightless booster, would a child crossing their legs to avoid slouching cause any safety concerns? So that's a great question. And it's something that we can't really test very easily with the tools that we have now. Um, the child crash test dummies just are not very flexible in their legs. They're designed to sit in a normal seated position and they physically cannot cross their legs <laughs> like that um, to do any crash testing. So it might be something that we could look at with um, like computer simulations and virtual computer crash testing. Um, which is coming really far these days, but um, of course that's not perfect either. So as far as we know, um, we don't really have much data on that. So, you know, if, if it's the difference, if crossing their legs helps to keep that lap belt where it belongs and helps to keep them upright and keeps that shoulder belt aligned, I would say, you know, that using the good, better, best mindset yeah, that's probably a better solution than allowing them to slouch and have really poor um, lap belt positioning. Um, so again, good, better, best. Um, I would say if that's the only option, yeah, go ahead and cross your legs if that's going to produce that better posture and better belt positioning. Um, but it's not something that we have extensively studied or crash tested or, or really have um, firm data to talk through. So again, Julie, thank you for your time today. Thank you everyone for being on today. And Hope you all have a great and safe day.